vacation, and I do believe he went to his uncle's funeral today also. And today is Andrea's birthday, so make sure you send her a text message or an email and wish her a happy birthday. Um, we do have um, a visiting pastor today. His name is Dave Osterlin, right here. <laughs> Dave comes from Seville Church, and I'm going to read you his bio. Uh, he retired from the University of Akron in 2012 as the Associate Vice President for Community Relations. During his 12 years at the university, he worked with other members of senior management, staff, and selected students on speech writing and effective public speaking techniques. In addition, he was an adjunct professor teaching business and professional speaking. Yay, we get a professional speaker today. His university career followed nearly 25 years at First Energy, where he was the speech writer for the president and other top executives, corporate speech coach, and was involved in many other aspects of the company's communication program. During his military service, Dave was assigned to the 1st United States Army Band near Washington, D.C., where he served as the concert announcer and musician. During his tour of duty, he performed before Presidents Johnson and Nixon, among other heads of state, and has participated in the inauguration of President Nixon and the memorial service of the former president, Dwight D. Eisenhower. He also spent the last six months of his military career in Armed Forces Radio in Washington. However, his first exposure to broadcasting occurred during high school as the lead singer of his rock band that appeared to be on Gilardi. Do we remember Gilardi? We're dating ourselves. Following his military discharge, he worked as on-air talent at radio stations in Worcester, Ohio, and Canton before joining WHLO in Akron under the broadcast name Scott Thomas. In addition, he freelanced as a news correspondent for CBS Radio in New York. He graduated from Kent State University with a Bachelor of Arts degree and continued postgraduate studies at both Kent State and New York University in New York City. He currently serves on the session of Seville Presbyterian Church as a public speaking consultant for the Presbyterian Church USA Synod of the Covenant. So please, let's give him a hand and thank him for coming today. Take any prayer requests. Um, do you have? I know Debbie, you wanted us to put Sansi, uh, say special prayers for Sansi yes. today. your neighbor, right, Justine? Yeah. Debbie? Also prayers for um, Mel Thurber, who is um, our daughter Sarah's friend, and also Sarah. Mel Thurber? Thurber. He's in a serious motorcycle accident, and they're still trying to serve him. What all he's doing for him. Oh. Oh. Um. Also, on our bulletin on the back, 
we will have children's worship during the worship service, and Cindy is going to be our children's service teacher today. And then uh, Monday, July 26th, is our community dinner, and the mayor, Bill Robertson, is speaking about the Ripman Salt Coalition. Um, if you're interested in salt and what it's all about, um, you'll have to come and listen to Bill. And uh, I do believe someone else is going to be coming with him also uh, to speak about something else that's going on in the city. Something about parks and recreation or something. The nature preserve. <laughs> and then I see some of you have brought school supplies. The women are collecting their annual school supplies uh, for the elementary school. And um, we need things like pencils, crayons, loose leaf, wide narrow notebook paper, backpacks, chapstick, boys and girls underwear, um, and pants. Like in case, you know, in the winter, they use them a lot when the kids get wet and they don't want them to sit in wet pants or anything. So we uh, donate um, uh, pants for them. Long pants, sweatpants. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. Okay, at this time, I think I'm going to start the call to worship. And it's from Psalm 119, verses 103 to 105. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gained understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. If you would please join me, you need your Presbyterian hymnals, the blue ones, page 466, Oh, for a thousand tongues I sing.
of our salvation, writes in his letter to the Romans, The word is near you, and it is in your mouth and in your heart, that this is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now look forward to life as one who has been forgiven by offering the same gift of God's mercy to, to others. Please join me in the glory patre. Scripture lesson this morning comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 6 verses 10 through 12 and if you're following along in the Pew Bibles the passage begins in the middle of the left column on page 1041 listen now for the truth in God's wisdom whatever exists has already been named and what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is a stranger. The more the words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a person in life during his few and meaningless days that pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun, after they're gone. This is the holy wisdom and the holy word. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture and lesson this morning comes from Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 1 through 3 and verse 21. If you're following along in the Pew Bibles, the passage begins at the beginning page 1,154, so listen now for the encouragement God gives through the Holy Spirit. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your inequities have separated you from the God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. The lesson concludes with the 21st verse. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips on the lips of your children, and on the lips of their descendants. From this time on and forever, says the Lord. This is a holy wisdom and a holy word. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to invite Cindy Mann forward to teach the kids a little bit about the importance of the power of simple words.
thank you for coming forward. I was hoping somebody would come with me. And you want to have a seat up here on the, the front? Oh, and I see Merida coming. Hey, Merida, you want to come up here for children's worship? Yay! You're special, and I was supposed to read something about speaking. Well, I had to find the book that would be appropriate, and this one is called You Are Special, and it's about what we say to other people makes a big difference. And this is about um, a group of people called the Wemmicks. The Wemmicks were small wooden people carved by a woodworker named Eli. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes, some were tall, and others were short. <coughs> Each Wemmick had a box of golden star stickers and gray dot stickers. The wooden people went around the village sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones got stars, the Wemmicks with rough wood or chip paint got dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could jump over tall boxes or sing pretty songs. Others, though, could do little. They got dots. Punchinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like others, but he always fell. So the Wemmicks would give him dots. When he tried to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, so the Wemmicks would dot him. So he'd give him more dots. He deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would say. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I guess I'm a, not a good wemmick, he decided, so he stayed inside most of the time. And when he did go outside and hung around other wemmicks who had lots of dots, he felt better around them. One day, he met a different kind of wemmick named Lucia. She had no dots or stars. The wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would give her a star, but it would fall off. Others gave her a dot for having no stars, but it wouldn't stay on either. Now you wonder why that was, huh? That's the way I wanted to be, thought Punchinello, so he asked Lucia how she did it. It's easy, she replied. Every day I go visit Eli the woodcarver. Why? You'll find out if you go see him, said Lucia. Then she turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me, Punchinello wondered. Later at home, he sat and watched the wooden people giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself, and he decided to go see Eli. Punchinello walked up the narrow path and stepped into Eli's shop. His eyes grew big. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on tiptoe to see the top of the workbench. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. Then he heard his name. Punchinello! The voice was deep and strong. How good to see you. Come, let me have a look at you. Punchinello looked up. You know my name? Of course. I made you. Eli picked him up and set him on the bench. Looks like you've been given some bad marks, said the maker. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. But no, I don't care what the other women think. You don't? No, you shouldn't either. What they think doesn't matter. All that matters is what I think. And I think you're pretty special. Punchinello laughed. Me? Special? Why? I'm not very talented, and my paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello didn't. 
didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met Lucia, said Punchinello. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly because she has decided that what I think is more important than what others think. The stickers only stick. Eli smiled. <coughs> you will, but it will take time. For now, come see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said as Punchinello was leaving, you are special because I made you, and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, So who else thinks that we are all very special? Mm -hmm. Who's special? Who thinks you're special, Merida? Jesus? Yeah, I think you're special, and Jesus and our God thinks that everybody here is special. We have to remember that because God doesn't make mistakes. He made us all, and he's known who we are from the very beginning. So I want you now to be in prayer with me and say a little prayer. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for being with us today, and thank you for making us all special. And please be with us to guide us in everything that we do that we can show to other people how special they are. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I have some very good memories uh, of this uh, church and particularly this sanctuary. Um, I don't know if, how many of you remember the old Muskinga Minor. Used to be the top five churches in the Presbytery. We'd get together for soup suppers right around Easter, and the youth groups would get together and, and have a lot of fun. And again, I have great memories of Milton and also of Rittman. My sister-in-law uh, taught at Rittman Elementary School for 35 years, fifth grade. Some of, some of you may have had her. And ironically, they're celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary uh, next month. She and my brother. And I used to work uh, a lot with some people here in the uh, church, including one of my favorite people, Jim Watt. Uh, and I'm happy to see that uh, he's got an emeritus in front of his name in the bulletin. Having come from academia, I can tell you that is a very, very special designation. Something I think he's, he's very worthy of. And also, I've had a chance to work with uh, Alex Barnes, also very impressive. But uh, the one thing I used to enjoy about this place is the youth groups that we get together. And I can remember standing in that center aisle and uh, meeting a lot of different people and making friends. Some friends I was able to stick with for, for quite a while. But for some of you younger ones up here looking at me, you're probably thinking, wow, I didn't know this building was that old. But anyway, I would like to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. And I think the best way to start is take a look at the sermon title. Writing a six-word sermon. Well, I mean, you're probably already thinking to yourself, your own six-word response, he already has exceeded six words. <laughs> However, truth be told, 
It takes me more than 10 times that many words just to order breakfast of Bob Evans. But hopefully this sermon will all make sense when we finish. You see, in today's fast-paced world, time is at a premium. The population is exploding. Information is exploding through social media. And everyone, it seems, is vying for our attention. At the same time, the average attention span is shrinking. One of the points I make to my speech classes is that the average attention span of an adult in an audience, or in this case, a congregation, is only about 20 seconds. Now, that doesn't mean they're tuning out the speaker. At least I hope that's not the case. And the departure is only temporary. They're just mentally attending to other pieces of business that happened across their minds. For example, before I left for church today, did I remember to close the windows and lock the doors? Or, what time was I supposed to pick up the kids? Where are the kids? Thus, one of our primary concerns as communicators, whether addressing an audience of one or 1,000, is the ability to convey our thoughts concisely and clearly. In fact, if you will find that the con contrast to that old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, a few strategically placed words can be worth a thousand pictures. This type of communication approach is nothing new. Some of history's most far-reaching and influential documents are noted for their conciseness. For example, rounded off, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is 260 words. The Declaration of Independence consists of 1,300 words. And the Lord's Prayer, Presbyterian style with debts and debtors, is just under 70 words. At the same time, the employer's tax code from the U.S. Internal Revenue Service is 37,000 words and the tax code is probably over two million. Indeed, brevity is not something that just happens. It requires work. It requires time and attention to detail. Roman statesman Marcus T. Cicero once wrote to a colleague, if I had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. One fairly well-known example of a clear and concise method of getting one's point across is the so-called elevator speech. Now, the origin of the term comes from the notion that we meet important people in elevators, particularly where we work. People who often can help our careers, people who can improve our businesses or enrich our lives. It also means that in an elevator, at least in principle, you have a captive audience to whom you can deliver a 15 to 30 second core message, depending upon the height of the building, of course, before the elevator reaches its final destination, opens its doors, and frees its captives. A portrayal of the elevator speech was a key scene in the 1988 award-winning movie Working Girl, starring Harrison Ford, Melanie Griffith, and Courtney Weaver. After being fired from her secretarial job at a New York brokerage firm, the film's heroine, Tess McGill, jumps into the lobby elevator with the owner of one of the firm's biggest clients. In a passionate 30-second speech, she presents her lucrative marketing plan to save his large company from a rival takeover and immediately on the spot is offered an executive position with the company all before reaching the top floor. Wow. This movie's elevator ride is fiction. Or in this case, probably pure fantasy. But the concept behind the elevator speech is very real. 
for an entrepreneur pitching an idea to a venture capitalist, or effectively marketing oneself to a potential employer, networking opportunities with friends, and maybe just working on our evangelism, all must be accomplished succinctly in one symbolic elevator ride. In most instances, we will find that less is more. It has to do with eliminating visual and mental clutter. We cannot focus if there is too much to look at or to think about. Fewer words create more distinction. More distinction makes it easier to grasp the concept and to store it in our memory bank. And some great theologians have recognized this. For example, as we read this morning scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter 6, the more words you speak, the less they mean. Then there's the quote by Martin Luther. The fewer the words, the better the prayer. Unfortunately, Luther never said anything about sermon length. Many of the greatest writers recognize the importance of brevity. According to literary legend, Ernest Hemingway was challenged to write a story in only six words. He wrote, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Now let's think about that for a second. To my knowledge, no one ever asked Hemingway what he meant, but many believe that Hemingway based his six words on our apparent need to grow up too quickly, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Some think Hemingway regarded this work among his most challenging. Some say he did it on a whim. Others say it was a part of it. Nevertheless, what he wrote, whether fact or fiction, clearly demonstrated that six words can carry a lot of weight. The most recent twist of the six-word essay was inspired by Smith Magazine. Smith Magazine is an online platform for storytellers. Founded by longtime editor Larry Smith, the user-generated website allows readers to share stories and to participate in various writing contests, including Smith's challenge to his readers to write their memoirs in only six words. Well, Smith Magazine received more than 15,000 entries from across the United States. Taking the best, they published the book entitled Not Quite What I Was Planning, Six Word Memoirs by Writers, Famous, and obscure, which by the way did become a New York Times bestseller. Smith Magazine describes its book as, and I quote, a glorious mishmash of a myriad of voices, a thousand little windows into humanity, six words at a time. Now this challenging writing exercise has already been labeled as American haiku. It's full of human drama, providing some of the funniest and most inspiring insights into life, and some of the most painful as well. The book is full of well-known names, including novelist Dave Eggers, who wrote his six words 15 years since last professional haircut. Singer Amy Mann couldn't cope so I wrote songs. Comedian Stephen Colbert, well, I thought it was funny. Yet some of the cleverest phrases came from those who found themselves being published for the first time. Here's some examples of their six word memoirs. One tooth, one cabbage, life's cruel. Live like no tomorrow. Tomorrow 
okay. Woman with man's name. Thanks, parents. Aging late bloomer yearns for duo. And as I get older, the one memoir in the book that I can mostly relate to used to add, now I subtract. Unfortunately, I did not know about this writing contest until after the book had already been published, or I would have at least submitted my favorite six word phrase. Relative to the book's title, I may not be famous, but I am certainly obscure. Here it is. Stop clock. Still accurate. Twice daily. While we know that solving major concerns typically demands more than six strategically placed words, this exercise certainly allows us to get to the core of the message, to the heart of who we are. Not only to discern where we are and where we've been, but more importantly, to help chart our course for the future. Sort of a mantra, actually. The six word phrase also can be found throughout the Bible. And I believe you know most of them. These words offer us comfort. And these words, more importantly, are passages that are short, and easy to remember. When I was in broadcasting, we called these sound bites. The Bible is full of six word sound bites. From the Psalms, here are three examples. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Commit your way to the Lord. Raise the song. Sound the tambourine from the book of Isaiah. Fear not, for I am with you. Second Corinthians, let light shine out of darkness. Revelations, and death shall be no more. Matthew, and I will give you and finally, two six-word passages from John. Let not your hearts be troubled. And that God gave us eternal life. These are just a few examples. There are many more six-word sound bites in the Bible. And frankly, each is a six-word sermon in and of As Christians, these strategically placed words provide us with hope. Hope, because the six word phrase is not an end, but simply a snapshot, part of a means to an end. These words can open windows to our journey and allow us to focus on what is really important and on what we want to concentrate. If you allow me a personal observation. When I originally researched this sermon, I decided to write my own six word memoir, which I will share with you. It's based on what might seem to me as a rewarding yet challenging career. You heard about some of it when I was introduced. I've experienced four different professions, not jobs, professions. In fact, include retirement. <laughs> I won my fifth career, best career ever. For me, all the changes were intriguing and quite frightening. And based simply on a leap of faith, a trust in God, and the support of my immediate family and my church family. Based on what I've just told you, here is my six word memoir. And I'm more than welcome to share it with each of you also. If you like to today. Life. A great ride. No seatbelts. If nothing else, what we've talked about this morning 
is a fun exercise, and I hope you'll give it a try, and I, I hope you'll share your six-word sermons with your friends and relatives, and those of you online, send them to us here at the church. I believe you'll discover what a few dynamic words can do. I believe you'll discover that your sermon does not have to mean anything to anyone but you. And I believe you'll discover more about yourself and about your relationship with God. Well, as my elevator reaches the top floor of what might seem as a really, really, really tall building this morning, I encourage you to reflect on your own life and challenges, to open your own windows, to search your soul, to put pen to paper, and to seriously contemplate where you are and what you think God has planned for you. Above all, I encourage all of you to trust in God's mercy, to be as better about faith and things to come, and to live by sense of which dwells only in the past and the present. And who knows? Maybe your best life sermon is yet to be written. Amen. Okay. Uh, please join us uh, in singing hymn 426 in the Presbyterian hymnal. Lord, speak to me that I may speak your six words. <laughs> Kim's husband, uh, six years old. 
congratulations. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you with humility and reverence, praising you with all our being. For we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you, the one who never changes. We recognize those things, both large and small, with which you have blessed us, and we take comfort in knowing you stand next to us in grief. And now let us quietly remember those who need our prayer. Many of our concerns and joys have been expressed to you this morning. Give us the strength to deal with these and others that are known only to you and those individuals who need your comfort. Let us also recognize our forgetfulness in giving thanks each and every day. Forgive us for our humanity. And help us gather the inner strength that only you can provide. May we learn to thank you for the good and trust that the evil be made good by you. For you alone are worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you could please join me in singing hymn number 324, Open My Eyes That I May See. See 
the ups and downs of everyday elevator rides. Remember this wisdom from Proverbs 12 through 18. And conclude the blessing with Corinthians 13, verse 4. The words of their reckless peace pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.